see all the, the wizards underneath. All right. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Welcome back to Grand Rounds for the Department of Medicine at Washington University School of Medicine. My name is John Hickman, one of the chief residents. It's my pleasure, as always, to welcome you back. On behalf of our chair, Dr. Frazier, Drs. Costco, Spencer, and myself, we are so excited to be joined for the Hampton Lecture today in the Division of Allergy and Immunology. Before we get there, I just want to say a brief uh, a couple of reminders, as always. If you missed any past talks, please head over to the Department of Medicine website, check out our YouTube channel where recordings are there. Also, if you have any questions as we go along, please send them if you're online via the Q&A function. I will help moderate those with our speaker once we get to the end. And without any further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Kendall. She is the current chief in the Division of Allergy and Immunology. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Kendall. Thank you, John. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. We have a few people in the audience. It's nice to be hybrid at least. And I just, I can't wait until we're all back together and we can uh, see each other. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Kim Blumenthal today, who's going to give our Stanley F. Hampton uh, lecture in clinical immunology. Uh, the Stanley uh, F. Hampton endowment was given to us in 1989. At the time of his death, his wife gave money to uh, Wash U to endow this lecture. Uh, however, we didn't find out about it until 2018. Somehow it was in some uh, accountant's office, I guess. Uh, but even if we had found out about it back at that time, uh, today we would still be presenting uh, a lecture that's a historical look back at our field. Um, and, and that's a pleasure. And I think as we go forward uh, for a lot of these endowed lectureships and as the families sort of trickle away from St. Louis, uh, we'll be using these as a look back. And so uh, we, we still have endowments that are coming in now that will allow our future uh, house staff and residents and, and faculty to know what we were doing. So uh, this is 107 years after the first allergy clinic was established in the medical school. It was originally an asthma clinic. 75 years after Dr. Hampton joined the faculty and 33 years after the lectureship was endowed. Uh, from the WashU Bulletin, uh, his obituary told us that he was regarded as the first physician in the US to be certified as an allergy specialist. He received his medical degree from WashU in 1934 and joined the Barnes staff in 1940. He was named director of the medical school in 1953 and co-director in 1960. He was a founding trustee of the Allergy Foundation of America. He was a fellow, a past president, a past treasurer and executive committee member of the American Academy of Allergy. And he received the American Academy of Allergy Distinguished Award in 1975. This is a picture of him 20 years before his death when he was presenting uh, accolades to a different faculty member. Um, this is an excerpt from uh, his president's address to the American Academy of Allergy, which took place in 1956 here in St. Louis. And he says, it, it is with great pleasure that I call to your attention the fact that for the first time in the history of medicine, there has been established within the framework of the National Institutes of Health, a National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. It took place only two or three weeks ago. And I know lots of people here in the audience have funding from NAID and it's been so instrumental in our recent COVID uh, um, epidemic and, um, and has had an illustrious history since that time. His scientific career back in the times, uh, back in the 40s, he published over 20 peer reviewed articles in the listed journals here. A lot of his work dealt with the preparation and characterization and storage of allergy extracts. Back then, we didn't really know very much about what was causing uh, these diseases. It, we didn't have any medicines for it particularly. It was very miserable for you know, the people who had it, particularly children uh, who, who had asthma and allergies and it would keep them out of school and um, even sometimes in bed to try through school year to try to recover um, from these diseases. Uh, he was also the first to demonstrate that maternal fetal transfer of the substance in serum that caused allergies uh, 
did not occur or was minimal. They called it reagent then. They didn't know about uh, IgE and it's hard to imagine uh, them doing these very, uh, very what we would call now gross biological uh, assays where he used cord blood from the mother and the baby. Uh, he used the placenta, he used skin testing. It was pretty, um, had a couple hundred patients. So it was a, a, a decent Jake's med paper for the time. And I, I just gave you a screenshot here of the PubMed on him and what you'll, you'll see this placental transmission of antibodies uh, down at the bottom. And then at the, and that was 1940. And then at the top, you'll see he was also publishing in 1947 on anaphylactic shock in egg sensitive individuals following vaccination with typhus vaccine. So um, even, even then we were looking at early vaccine reactions and now we're still looking at vaccine reactions and the allergist immunologists have a key role in doing that. And so it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Kim Blumenthal, who is from Harvard and is gonna deliver our lecture and talk about that very topic, COVID, uh, al allergy to COVID vaccine. Um, she's a drug allergy expert from Harvard and Mass General. She has uh, over a hundred papers funding from multiple sources, including the NIH to study clinical and economic impact of penicillin allergy and also the immune tolerance network to investigate allergic reactions to COVID vaccines. She got her undergraduate degree in economics at Columbia, and interestingly, was a research analyst at Goldman Sachs for a couple of years. Uh, and it looks like you did pre-med studies during the same time, maybe at Harvard. Uh, she got her MD at Yale, a master's degree in epidemiology at Harvard, where she also did her residency clinical and research fellowships, uh, joined the faculty there at 2015. She's an assistant professor and she has done her work in antibiotic allergy under the uh, mentorship of Dr. R Rochelle Walensky, who's now with the CDC and came to talk to us as you'll remember a couple of weeks ago. So Kim, welcome. Say hello to Dr. Blumenthal. Thank you so much for having me here today and for inviting me to give such a wonderful lectureship in honor of uh, a real pioneer in our field. And I was a K awardee from NIAD and this is just, it's phenomenal to be here today. I wanna start with uh, COVID, apologies. Why, the reason we're, we're still hybrid. Uh, COVID-19 is responsible for 6 million deaths worldwide from over 350 million confirmed cases. And in the United States, deaths are at approximately 850,000. One year after the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic, Americans welcomed two novel COVID-19 mRNA vaccines in December 9, 2020. And this was the same day that anaphylaxis was identified from these vaccines. Anaphylaxis wasn't anticipated from any of the clinical trial results. So this raised concerns that were substantial enough to lead the UK to restrict vaccination in any individual with a history of vaccine medication or food allergy. And this restriction lasted just a few weeks, was lifted December 30th, 2020. But with reports in the lay press, as well as scientific uh, risk research on Pfizer and Moderna causing anaphylaxis, really the vaccine hesitancy due to allergic reactions remains prevalent and really still impactful today. This graphic demonstrates the variety of vaccine reactions that we anticipated seeing from mRNA vaccines. These include immediate reactions, potentially something from IgE, another uh, potential cause could be a non-IgE mechanism. And then there even could be non-immune mechanisms in this sort of immediate category. And then there are also delayed category reactions. And we'll kind of use the cut point of four hours between our immediate and our delayed. And those were considered to be things like site reactions, potentially urticaria, serum sickness, and other reactions. We'll begin with a tour of immediate reactions after COVID-19 vaccines, particularly focusing on mRNA vaccines and using that four hour cutoff point for what is immediate. 
And to start, we'll back up and think about what we know about immediate reactions to vaccines before the mRNA vaccines. And so prior to the mRNA vaccines, we considered that vaccine anaphylaxis was rare, it occurred in just 1.31 per million doses. And this comes from a, a study from the CDC Vaccine Safety Data Link, which covers 9 million adults and children, 2009 to 2011. The cases were identified by their diagnostic codes and they were validated according to the gold standard vaccine anaphylaxis criteria called the Brighton Collaboration Criteria. And what we can see here is that uh, the, um, in the middle there, the number of cases that informed the estimates. And then on the right, you can see the incidence rate per million doses. Uh, and we can see that the uh, incidence does vary by different vaccines. Of course, there are very few cases that even informed our knowledge of vaccine anaphylaxis, ranging from as low as 0.51 for the, the tetanus diphtheria pertussis vaccine to as high as 86.1 per million for rabies vaccine. This is another recent study that I contributed to where we looked at the background risk of vaccine anaphylaxis using two different observational data sets. Uh, one is called uh, NEDS, and that's the Nationwide Emergency Department Sample. And then the other is called VAERS. I think we all probably know VAERS. This is the CDC's Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. And uh, what you can see on the graph is actually severe allergic reactions per 1 million population. And, uh, and you can see the NEDS in the solid gray and black lines, and you can see the uh, VAERS in the dotted gray and black lines. In this study, you can see that vaccine anaphylaxis declined from 2006 to 2018 in the NEDS data set. Um, and you can see that NEDS captures more events than VAERS because VAERS, as we know, relies on voluntary reporting, whereas NEDS is reporting by diagnostic codes. Um, what is important from this study is also that vaccine anaphylaxis deaths occur. Death was rare, but they were described and they did occur. And that the, the, the patients that were getting vaccine anaphylaxis prior to mRNA vaccines, uh, those at risk, the risk factors that were identified are older age, particularly over 65, male sex, and the presence of a chronic medical condition. So now let's move to COVID-19 vaccines. And this is an early meta-analysis that looked at adjudicated or confirmed cases of COVID-19, regardless of the study design or the method of reporting, as long as each study gave more than 20,000 doses of a vaccine. In this study, the meta-analyzed incidence was quite low, just 7.91 per million doses. And the confidence interval really just from four per million to 15.59 per million. Now, these were the cases that were informing the mRNA anaphylaxis estimates. And you can see that it includes the CDC, uh, a couple of clinical trials, governmental sources. And then we're also on here, <laughs> MGB, Mass General Brigham in Boston. And our estimate is a little bit higher than the others. And so I do wanna review our methods to simply compare um, why our estimate is uh, higher than the others. So in our, uh, uh, Northeastern employee cohort, we vaccinated about 65,000 uh, employees across the Northeastern United States, Massachusetts, largely Massachusetts, New Hampshire. The sign up for vaccination prior to um, receiving a vaccine required answering a few pre vaccine questions that uh, ended up being uh, data input uh, points for us, which were Did you have a history of anaphylaxis? and was there an allergy to an injectable medicine vaccine or an inactive ingredient. We also had a post-vaccination survey that was administered on day one, day two, day three after vaccination. And at least one symptom survey post-vaccination was completed by over 80% of these employees. We think they thought that it was mandatory. Um, <laughs> So we also uh, had 17 different vaccine clinics and we provided allergist on-call service to be able to help with any diagnosis or management issues regarding uh, vaccine anaphylaxis or potential allergic reactions. We asked them to also file safety reports if there were um, any potential reactions. So in all, to identify that incidence, we screened a number of items. So 85 individuals matched a symptom survey that was potentially anaphylaxis. 
Uh, there were 169 safety reports, 546 pages to the allergists in our system, and 795 allergy referrals were placed between dose one and dose two. That's a lot of work. In all, we uh, identified 58 cases of allergic reactions for comprehensive review, and then confirmed just 16 cases of anaphylaxis by these two criteria, one being the Brighton anaphylaxis criteria and the other being the NIAID FAN criteria. That's the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease Food Allergy Anaphylaxis Network criteria. And that second criteria is one that the allergists prefer to use. Our 16 cases use this risk averse method of saying you're anaphylaxis uh, if you meet either criteria. But you can see that just seven individuals of all of the over 65,000 uh, healthcare employees with prospective tracking met both criteria. You can see that uh, this, so we go from 16 to seven. So it, certainly the criteria that we use matters, but really the study design matters so much to the incidence estimates. So our estimate was 1.1 to 2.5 per 10,000 vaccinations, which is 110 to 250 per million first doses. So it's still very, very rare, but more than the eight per million in the meta-analysis. Another interesting thing that we see here and we continue to see, which I'll mention, is that it looks like Pfizer estimate point estimates are uh, higher than Moderna point estimates for immediate reactions that are consistent with anaphylaxis, but the p-values are nowhere near significant to say uh, Pfizer causes more anaphylaxis than Moderna. Let's talk a little bit about who these 16 individuals were. Uh, they were demographically similar to those reported by the CDC. They were 40 female prior allergies in 63%, prior anaphylaxis in 31%. The patients most commonly had cutaneous or respiratory signs and symptoms. GI symptoms were less common. Almost all had symptoms within 30 minutes, 94%. Um, and uh, most of the time, the treatment setting was simply the emergency department with discharge. One patient hospitalized, one patient hospitalized requiring ICU level care. Those are different patients. Um, one of the interesting things we, we see is that the Brighton level is a, uh, gives us diagnostic certainty, and Brighton level one is the most certain. This is a case of anaphylaxis, and that was actually just one individual, whereas Brighton level two is likely anaphylaxis uh, level certainty, and that was uh, 13 of the individuals. Now, we did ask uh, all of our emergency rooms to please collect triptase. Um, it was captured in just five of these individuals, 32%, and it was only elevated in one patient, and it wasn't elevated higher than the maximum normal. It was elevated for this particular person who had a baseline of 4.3, went to 7.7 .7 in the setting of a reaction, and then back towards a lower normal, and this was associated with a Moderna vaccine anaphylaxis. One of the differences in our cases compared to the CDC cases is that the CDC cases all were treated in healthcare settings. Almost half were hospitalized, including 18 in the ICU, seven requiring endotracheal intubation. So certainly our cases were much more mild, um, but we'd also provided sort of at the um, uh, support, um, at the elbow support for all of the vaccine clinics of an allergist. Um, and it's possibly we detected things uh, earlier onset and therefore had mild, more mild cases. I wanna mention the only other population-based cohort that exists to date um, is from Kaiser Permanente. And what uh, they are uniquely able to do is to capture sort of all S allergic reactions that are treated. Um, and so what they were uh, able to identify is that dose one, 0.028% had treated allergic reactions. That's about 280 per million. And then for dose two, it was lower at 140 per million second doses. And then for anaphylaxis, really, really low estimate, actually below that meta-analytic estimate at 3.3 per million um, was treated anaphylaxis. Um, in, our, in some of our patients, they never sought treatment. They uh, uh, were allergy patients who used their own epinephrine and went home. So it wouldn't have caught these types of individuals, but it ca catches uh, most of those uh, certainly severe or persistent anaphylactic cases. What is great about this study was that they shined a light on the demographic differences between mRNA vaccine anaphylaxis and prior vaccine anaphylaxis, and that the people getting anaphylaxis to mRNA vaccines, younger age, female sex, drug allergy history. 
after caring for so many of our employees, we actually started a registry online called the COVID-19 Vaccine Allergy Case Registry. And this was just to collect and share reports of vaccine reactions as they emerged. Uh, reporting for clinicians opened February 2021 and actually be open for patient self-reporting uh, in March 2021. And just as, as of last week, we had 2,361 reactions reported by patients and 490 entered by clinicians. The data come from 49 U.S. states and three U.S. territories. So while many of these allergic reactions that are entered are not cases of anaphylaxis, we recently analyzed cases of clinician-diagnosed anaphylaxis from this registry. And the results are useful in that they confirm the demographics of the patients experiencing anaphylaxis, their strong allergy histories, the cases appear dominant, dominant uh, Pfizer and first dose, that epinephrine is not routinely necessary for all of the cases, or not in routinely administered for all of the cases. Um, and uh, the two cases, the 3% that required epinephrine drip, those were both Pfizer cases. Uh, and the care is largely in the emergency room with not uh, that many individuals requiring hospitalization. I continue to wonder when I'm uh, caring for patients who've had reactions, whether there's something I can suggest now that mixing and matching is appropriate between changing from Pfizer to Moderna. This was a second meta-analysis that again tried to piece apart. Is, it, is Pfizer higher than Moderna as far as immediate onset anaphylactic reactions? And the combined estimate for Pfizer was about eight per million and for Moderna is about three per million. And so we can say, well, maybe there seems to be a Pfizer could cause more, but it's all very small. And also those confidence intervals are entirely overlapping. And so we still can't say with any definite um, confidence that uh, somebody who experienced a Pfizer anaphylaxis, for example, <clears throat> would tolerate Moderna. The incidence of allergy after these mRNA vaccines is also going to just depend on what population of interest we have. So our cohort was healthcare workers in the northeastern United States where allergy is high. And also healthcare workers, as I'll show you later, are very um, predominantly female and middle-aged, sort of that key demographic that seems to be having the problems. Uh, so this is a study from Israel that was also looking at healthcare workers, and they were simply identifying their highest risk allergy individuals from their healthcare workforce, and then they were vaccinating them under observation. And they identified 429 of these individuals. And the mean age was 52, 71% were female, and prior allergies in all of them, and then anaphylaxis in 63% of them. So 40, 429, all of them received dose one under observation, and 98% had no reaction. So that was like a, a dream for allergists, right? So only have 2% of the people have reactions. And then when they reacted, it was just six people with mild allergic reactions and three had anaphylactic reactions. So certainly if you select these people, you will see anaphylaxis. And then 218 individuals received dose two under medical observation. And again, 98% had no allergic reactions and 1.8% 1, 1. had minor allergic reactions. So this is somewhere between the comfort of doing it in a vaccine clinic with a, you know, if you have high risk allergy people, you'll have, um, you will have allergic reactions, it's about 2%. Uh, and, but also maybe doesn't necessitate an allergist because only 2% are having reactions and they're large and mild. One thing that we've learned uh, since last year that is informing our uh, knowledge of mechanism and also in patient care every day is that the majority of these first dose reactions are not recurring. Uh, it's not acting or behaving like an IgE mediated process. This was a collaborative study between five institutions as seen here, Mass General, Britain Women's, Vanderbilt, Yale, UT Southwestern. And all in all, we had 189 individuals who had these immediate onset allergic reactions. Uh, and uh, 32 of those reactions were anaphylactic. Uh, these individuals, largely female, mean age 40, uh, it was a uh, Moderna uh, was 69%, Pfizer was just 31% of these individuals. Um, I think some of our healthcare systems gave more Moderna, which could lead to uh, that finding. Uh, in all, 84% of them received dose two. Um, and while 20% had mild allergic symptoms, everyone tolerated it. 
So coming from that study, a meta-analysis said, well, what is the risk if you have an allergic reaction, immediate onset allergic reaction to dose one, what's the risk of having a severe allergic reaction to dose two? Because this also informs where you give dose two, how you counsel our patients. Um, and in this meta-analysis, it has 22 studies, 1,366 individuals who had immediate onset allergic reactions. Um, and what we can see is that the risk of a severe immediate reaction in dose two among these super high risk individuals which is six, six informed by six, <laughs> six people. So 0.16% with the confidence interval from 0.01 to 2.94%. Uh, the risk of mild symptoms was higher. So we have to be willing to put up with some management and diagnosis of mild allergic reaction in these individuals. It can recur, but it's not necessarily recurring worse like IgE would be expected to do. There were also no deaths reported, and this is useful in my patient counseling every day. Now, the mechanism of these reactions, these immediate onset allergic anaphylactic reactions, is still not known. And early on, we thought that we should be looking at what is in these lipid nanoparticles, what components could be contributing, because components have always been important to vaccine allergy. If you think about the history of gelatin, egg, latex, uh, we are often thinking about the components in the vaccine rather than the immunizing agent itself. Well, in this lipid nanoparticle, there's a PEG, um, polyethylene glycol, 2000 molecule, and it stabilizes the lipid nanoparticle. And no individuals with PEG allergy were included in the clinical trials. And there weren't many individuals with allergy histories to begin with included in the clinical trials. So it's thought that potentially the PEG could be responsible by some mechanism IgM, IgG, or IgE. Uh, but it, it's also possible that there was, uh, as you can see here, other types of predicted immunogenicity, um, for, such as from complement activation or either pathogen associated molecular pattern receptors. So let's talk a little bit about mechanism. And a big caveat is that we don't know what's happening here. But what we do know is that anaphylaxis can is typically a, a thought to be IgE mediated with mast cell activation, antigen binding, cross-linking of IgE, as we can see on the left. We now have a few published cases to date that suggest there could be an IgE process, but it's not the dominant phenotype. And in those cases, maybe the vaccine skin test is positive, maybe the polyethylene glycol and the vaccine skin test was positive, or maybe just those six individuals in that meta-analysis who had severe recurrent reactions might be these IgE type people. But anaphylaxis could instead occur through non-IgE mediated mechanisms. And there are a host of different processes that could be responsible here. Now, because the reactions are not predictably recurring and potentially premedication might be helpful, it does seem that a non-IgE mediated process might be the dominant phenotype of these immediate onset allergic reactions. But of course, we have to remember that there's a broad differential. There was IgE, non-IgE, and then non-immune when we looked at that first graphic. And so we have to remember that there are other things that could cause immediate onset reactions after the vaccine. So you could have anaphylaxis due to another cause. So taking a detailed history is important. It could be urticaria and edema misdiagnosed as anaphylaxis. Uh, the patient could have an underlying mast cell disorder, flushing disorder could be vocal cord dysfunction. Um, and I wanna focus a little bit on this one, um, stress responses. So there is an, a stress response that has always been identified with vaccination and recently has just gotten a little bit more um, attention because it's been renamed to be more comprehensive. It's called the uh, Immunization Stress-Related Response or ISRR. Uh, so we have a large group called um, Adverse Events Following Vaccination. Um, immunization, AEFI. And there was always this number four here. These were immunization anxiety related reactions. This was renamed the immunization stress related reaction. And this might be a contributor to some of the responses we're seeing, especially with vaccination, especially because of its COVID vaccination and just the emotional valence of the pandemic on everyone. Some of the examples of patients that I've seen that might have stress response rather than anaphylaxis or an allergic reaction might be puritis or tingling without any visible skin changes, tongue 
uh, or throat swelling, but a normal oropharyngeal exam, shortness of breath without wheezing or stridor, lightheadedness with a high uh, or normal blood pressure. This is a very useful table that was uh, posted by the World Health Organization to help identify and distinguish between anaphylaxis, vasovagal reactions, and stress-related reactions, the sympathetic stress response I just reviewed, the ISRR. And what we can do is we can use timing as well as signs and symptoms to help um, kind of narrow down what we think might be going on and really consider with the patient in front of us whether um, one of the either vasovagal response or the stress reaction could have been uh, the cause of the symptoms. I think probably the most useful is the onset or timing because uh, anaphylaxis will occur hopefully later in onset than the vasovagal and the stress reaction. Also, skin findings are also usually very different with anaphylaxis characterized by hives, swelling, rashes, flushing, and vasovagal and stress responses being more pale, sweaty, cold, clammy. I'd like to also talk about something called the nocebo effect, which is similar to the placebo effect um, when it's an inert substance. So the nocebo effect is an untoward reaction following the administration of an indifferent substance. And as a drug allergy specialist, I commonly would see this when we would do drug challenges in patients. And uh, it turns out that doing placebo controlled drug challenges in patients with a history of allergy is quite useful because you can identify patients reacting to placebo. Even for beta-lactam antibiotics in one study, 8% of those reacted to placebo. In a study in Spain, over 600 patients, 27% of drug allergy patients reacted to placebo. And the placebo reactors are more commonly female and with more drug allergy labels. And these reactions can also have objective findings. It's not just uh, the subjective without objective confirmation. Recently, with the mRNA vaccines, a meta-analysis looked at the nocebo effect from the clinical trials published for Pfizer and Moderna. And what they identified is that uh, systemic adverse events after dose one were 35% and dose two, 32% to the placebo. So no SIBO responses accounted for 76% of the systemic and 24% of the local adverse events following these vaccines. So I'd like to turn now to that question of the excipient, that polyethylene glycol and whether it's useful to test to polyethylene glycol or its cousin polysorbate um, for patients who had immediate reactions. So early on, we did not have any access to the vaccine. And when it's the vaccine's under EUA, we're not supposed to use it for skin testing, dilution, or desensitization, really. So we waited until um, it was fully approved to uh, start trying to see whether skin testing might be helpful. But we did try to skin test to the excipients. So two polyethylene glycol 3350, which is not polyethylene glycol 2000 conjugated to the lipid, which is what's in the, which is in the vaccine. And then we also tested to polysorbate 80, which is, uh, had been described to be uh, cross-reactive with polyethylene glycol. And what we learned from this was that it wasn't very helpful. It was not a great diagnostic tool. So it turns out most of the individuals, these are 65 uh, individuals we saw with immediate onset allergic-like reactions. Um, and most were negative. Uh, 57 of those individuals had just totally negative skin tests. So it wasn't picking up a lot of positives. And then of those who were positive, um, half of them in both groups tolerated the second dose. And um, oftentimes it was that they didn't receive the dose rather than they didn't tolerate it if they were positive, they were too concerned. Um, so we learned from here that uh, PEG and polysorbate use as a skin test doesn't really have much uh, predictive value to be helpful in the evaluation. And then conversely, what we've learned is that even though the CDC says it's a contraindication, if you have a PEG allergy to get an mRNA vaccine, that's not necessarily true anymore. First, there was a case series of 12 individuals who had PEG allergy, most to Miralax, and they had positive skin tests or they had a um, drug provocation test, the DPT that was positive and 10 of them received mRNA vaccines without a problem. And then three studies where uh, individuals with PEG asparaginase allergy received the um, mRNA vaccines, over 80 mRNA vaccines between these three, three studies without any reaction, and paclitaxel, which is also related to polyethylene glycol. 17 individuals who received, 12 received mRNA vaccines without a reaction. 
So these are small case series. It's not going to demonstrate safety, but it does uh, really confirm that the mechanism that is concerning us is not potentially PEG because all of these individuals had real allergies to PEG or its derivatives and did fine. Although I presented what we know from the observational data for immediate reactions, I do want to mention that the incidence of anaphylactic and non-anaphylactic allergic reactions in a clinical trial sponsored by NIAID is forthcoming. Um, in this trial, adults um, and children received Pfizer, Moderna, or an initial placebo um, and were vaccinated under observation with samples collected before and after vaccination for each individual. This was performed across 27 sites, and I was the site PI for Mass General. Uh, the enrollment of adults was uh, 345 high allergy individuals and 267 comparison individuals. And these high allergy individuals, it was rigorously identified by allergists um, and most had drug allergy, food allergy, and 21% had a mast cell disorder. So the primary outcome for this clinical trial is the proportion of patients who have a systemic allergic reaction consistent with anaphylaxis, and they are also doing exploratory mechanistic studies. So. I definitely look forward to the results of this to help us sort of hone in on what is happening here. I will now move to delayed onset reactions, which is going to be everything after four hours, with the caveat that we don't necessarily have a ton of information um, in, as rigorously defined as we move farther away from the vaccination. Um, that's because studies can't collect the data as well, and there haven't been a focus on allergy or cutaneous reactions as much as the more severe safety concerns with the vaccines that have been studied. So using the same perspective, MGB employee cohort, we compared two groups of employees in this study. And first I'll just mention, this is why our cohort findings might be different from other studies. Our mean age is 42, 72% female across the 52,998 individuals included in the study. So we have uh, high-risk allergy individuals. Those are the people before sign up that said, I had a history of anaphylaxis, a history of vaccine anaphylaxis, or polyethylene glycol. And we had 474 of these individuals. And then no high-risk allergy was the remainder. <clears throat> I assume that there's probably some uh, high-risk allergy people in here who just didn't want to uh, answer honestly because they want to get vaccinated. Um, so it's not pure. It's real observational, real-world study. So what was a high-risk allergy? This was a severe reaction to a vaccine, injectable medicine, or another allergen. And then regardless of whether you had an allergic reaction or allergic symptoms in your symptom surveys at day one, two, or three, 97.6% of these individuals went on to dose two. <clears throat> what I'd like to show here is that uh, the patients who said they have a history of a high-risk allergy um, compared to no high-risk allergy, um, that the allergic symptoms after vaccination differed. Um, and it was quite high if you had a history of, of uh, allergy, 11.6% compared to no high-risk allergy was 4.7%. And here we have uh, for severe allergy, 1.3% and 0.3%. What were these allergic symptoms? Um, these are the ones that I use to counsel people who have a history of allergy, who are worried about having an allergic reaction because the anaphylaxis risk is really, really small. But what we should let them know is that they might have allergic symptoms. And what might those be? They will be hives. So hives were, oh, the, this is a relative risk of 3.81. So much more common if you have a history of high risk allergy compared to not, you're like about four times more likely to have hives than the other person. You're also more likely to have some swelling. Angioedema was about also relative risk of 4.36. And also I let them know that maybe dose one will be the worst because dose one seems higher than dose two. We're still studying boosters, of course. Um, and I also let them know about skin reactions because this also is a not anaphylaxis, but it also causes concern as to why is this happening. And we learned that in this uh, employee cohort that 1.9%, basically, so 2% of individuals after mRNA COVID-19 vaccination within three days will have some skin symptoms beyond the injection site. This was itching and rash, hives, swelling. But... If you keep going and get dose two, 83.4% of you will not have recurrence with dose two. So it's been very helpful counseling to have these employee data, at least for reassurance. And then letting them know that it's not, you're not out of the woods. If you didn't have a skin reaction and everything went, went, went fine with dose one, you still have about a 2% risk of having a reaction with dose two, an incident risk. 
Uh, another healthcare worker study said some uh, sort of similar 1.6% had hives um, in 24 hours after mRNA COVID-19 vaccination. Um, and I do just want to describe because what we are seeing much more now is just hives and swelling after vaccination. And so in the same registry, we just looked at the patients who had clinician reported urticaria or angioedema, and we had 58 of those patients. Um, and the, the similarities in the demographics are striking. This could be from the same as anaphylaxis, right? It's very much mean age 42, 88% female, 82% white. Um, now, did they have a history of chronic hives? Just 17%. So that means some people might recognize this and say, oh, it's my hives again, but the vast majority don't. And there was more of a balance here between Pfizer and Moderna. And my, my instinct here is that uh, it's because Moderna causes more, is causing more rashes. Um, and because you know, we're giving more Pfizer in this country, and if you look at the, the, the all of the anaphylaxis, Pfizer seems to predominate, and here we're more balanced, so it does seem to be tipped a little bit by Moderna. Um, and this is rarely confused with anaphylaxis. I show this because we shouldn't, we shouldn't be treating urticaria and angioedema with epinephrine, but it's not rapidly progressive urticaria and angioedema. It's more slow onset. 5% of people got epinephrine intramuscular. Most of the patients are getting steroids, which might have an impact on their response to vaccination and other things that we have to consider. And that the, this is not quite, not too morbid. We have home treatment, emergency room treatment, very few requiring hospitalization. Here are a few photos that were entered into our case registry of urticaria and angioedema after mRNA vaccination. Um, some of the patients we're seeing are developing chronic urticaria, so urticaria at six weeks or longer. And I think that it's really important to know this um, because we will see these in primary care, uh, infectious disease, uh, allergy, immunology, certainly dermatology. Um, and this is a Facebook support group that I was told about that um, had, as of January 22nd, uh, 3,200 members, chronic spontaneous urticaria after mRNA vaccines. And as you can see, the main disclaimer is this is not an anti-vaccine uh, Facebook group. And in fact, if you post anything that's anti-vaccine, you get booted. Um, but uh, I checked the other day and it's up to 5,500 members. So certainly this is something that is, um, is happening and we're seeing this um, chronic hives are occurring after mRNA vaccination. Is it the same as it was with other vaccines, but this is just a widespread mass vaccination rollout or is there something different about the mRNA vaccines causing more of a predisposition to chronic urticaria? And I think we have to figure that out. Uh, similarly to how I showed that the dose two risk could be high um, with um, a, uh, the incident risk was 2%. I think it's really important to recognize that booster doses can out of the blue also cause the same thing. So hives and swelling we're seeing. Um, we're actually also seeing a, a, a decent amount of um, inducible urticaria or dermatographism after booster vaccination. These three individuals um, are all very similar presentations where they had fine, they all had Moderna vaccine, dose one, dose two went fine. And then dose three came into us. Actually, the, the um, woman on the right did have some spontaneous urticaria after dose two, uh, three weeks later, but can't really tell whether that was related. And then um, either day 12, day 15, day 17 present with uh, hives and dermatographism. So if a patient presents with hives and dermatographism, it's obviously not contraindication to future vaccination, even it was, if it was brought on by the vaccine and the time fits. So it's really important to counsel the patients. As long as the onset was greater than four hours, as long as we're in this delay group, we are in an area where um, vaccination is not contraindicated. Um, we only are assessing other etiologies when it, there's a history that drives us there. Um, and we're starting with non-sedating antihistamines, titrating up to four times the dose, which is our typical for treatment of chronic urticaria or, or acute urticaria. And then if at six weeks things are continuing, we are moving to regular chronic urticaria treatment, such as the um, monoclonal antibody Zolaer or omalizumab. A few other skin reactions that have been seen, this is from the dermatology literature. This is grouping from a dermatology registry, different uh, vaccine-related reactions. And we have to consider relatedness. Uh, the time frame is if it's after 20 days, it's probably not related. Um, and so this is grouping everything within 20 days of a vaccination, looking at local site reactions or urticaria, morbilliformer options, delayed hypersensitivity. These are sort of large local reactions. And then erythromyalgia, 
I think the biggest take home from this to me is looking at it, you see it's like all women and all Moderna, um, very much uh, heavy uh, towards Moderna and female um, being um, the risk factors for having these cutaneous reactions after the vaccine. From the timing here, what I, what I get from this is that the timing might be different at the first dose and then it might for the second dose happen more soon um, if it recurs. These are a few of my patients who received, uh, who received the mRNA vaccines and developed profound morbilliform eruptions that required um, medical treatment, um, corticosteroids. This gentleman had an absolute eosinophil count of over a thousand. And this uh, young woman had this uh, an, a new elevated, mild elevation in ALT. She had this classic, what we'll look at as Moderna arm, and then uh, a morbilliform eruption. They were both treated with corticosteroids, and although they have no contraindication to future vaccination, if you were in their shoes, you can understand the risk benefit calculus that they're undergoing with. If they needed steroids for that second dose or the first dose, you know, what, what do they, are they going to need steroids again? Does that counter, uh, is that counterproductive considering they're trying to boost their, their COVID immunity? Uh, so these are all patients that really are requiring a little bit of vaccine counseling despite it not being a contraindication. Uh, this is a spectrum that has been described by the dermatologist as well as one histopathologic process. So um, these reactions, when they looked under a microscope, they were all very similar, but there was under a spectrum compare, um, that looked, um, uh, this is the sort of robust spectrum with papular vesicular, then a moderate spectrum that looked like pityriasis rosea, and then a mild spectrum that looks like um, a, a eczema eczema or um, a uh, papulous squamous dermatitis. Um, and so they called these the REP. Um, I, I don't, you know, we always need more acronyms, the vaccine related eruption of papules and plaques. I think it's useful to just recognize that there are skin reactions that are seemingly quite benign, especially to, to me when you look at them, but that are disruptive, they cause itch, they could cause disfigurement, um, and they might cause vaccine hesitancy. Even these could cause vaccine hesitancy. These are large localized reactions. These were a surprise, um, even though the Moderna clinical trial published that 0.8% had this after dose one, and after dose two, 0.32% had this, and it resolved over four to five days. Um, and so this was buried in the original Moderna trial. So when uh, our employees started to tell us about these huge re reactions at the site, that started occurring more like day eight. Um, and our primary care doctors were concerned about potential cellulitis until it was happening too much. Um, so these are uh, certainly looking under a microscope like delayed hypersensitivity, and they've certainly been called delayed hypersensitivity. Um, it's, this is a, a photo of one of the, uh, the gentlemen who was biopsied. Um, it's a lymphocytic infiltrate. There, are, there was a scattered mast cell, eosinophil, the CD4, CD8 breakdown was not uh, at all um, novel. It was a pretty a basic pathology, looked like delayed hypersensitivity, but I think it's important to note that it's not behaving like delayed hypersensitivity. So in delayed hypersensitivity, we would expect repeat, um, repeated reactions to, to, to occur and potentially be worse or earlier in onset. And these were the original case series of these 12 individuals um, and we followed them uh, dose two, only six had the, these reactions and at dose three, only four. And so it's not behaving like a delayed hypersensitivity. I think one of the most important things is that the counseling here is that it might not recur. It's obviously not a contraindication to future vaccination and it can be managed quite simply compared to the generalized rashes we had seen previously. A couple of uh, zebras that, I, that I'm showing. Um, here is a 52-year-old female who was on day eight of Moderna dose number one. This looks like Moderna arm, except for there's a large bullet. Um, so this, uh, if you recall, type four reactions or delayed hypersensitivity can cause bullet. So um, this could be on the same spectrum as that, but it's obviously more severe, requires wound care, potentially biopsy. Um, and this individual had repeated courses of antibiotics and steroids and um, is very uh, hesitant to get vaccinated again, even on the other arm. Uh, and then this is an individual who did fine with Moderna dose one, dose two. He is 57 and he presented to our hospital with pain and swelling day eight after Moderna booster. 
also had fever, elevated inflammatory markers, and he had a profound myositis. And the CAT scan and MRI reads looked concerning for possible in infection. They said phlegmonic changes. He was started on vancomycin and zosin. He was admitted to the hospital. He got a muscle biopsy. Um, he did not improve. He couldn't move his arm. They said, well, let's call allergy immunology. And we decided in, uh, when we were talking to infectious disease doctors that we should try to stop the antibiotics and give him some prednisone, and he did very well. Um, we're in the process of maybe writing him up for staining the muscle for um, the for uh, spike protein uh, in, situ, in situ hybridization. So uh, hopefully it might be more elucidating into the mechanism of this severe adverse uh, reaction after the Moderna vaccine, um, but we don't know at this point. And then finally, there's a question of these severe, the most severe drug reactions we ever see, um, the severe cutaneous adverse reactions or SCARF. So um, does this happen after mRNA vaccine? This is the only case that's published in, in the um, uh, oral medicine dental literature. Um, there are ulcerations that occurred at day five after Pfizer vaccine. There wasn't a fever, there was no rash, no biopsy. So I still don't think that we need to be concerned about severe cutaneous adverse reactions after mRNA vaccines. I think this is important for patients who might have a history of SCAR, who might be vaccine hesitant because of that. Um, and also uh, for those who have delayed reactions like the morbilliform eruption, when you're counseling them on repeat vaccination, we can let them know that there's really not a convincing case of severe cutaneous adverse reactions from these vaccines. But actually there is one potential from J&J. &J. This is either DRESS syndrome or AGEP, and it was published in a dermatology literature. It was um, a well-worked-up case of a 74-year-old man who had this eruption despite being on a low dose of prednisone for adrenal insufficiency. And uh, the um, had an absolute eosinophil count of 600 per liter, and he had an acute kidney injury, and the skin biopsy was consistent potentially with a, a acute generalized enzymatous pustulosis or AGEP because of the um, pustular uh, nature of the drug eruption, uh, the vaccine eruption. Um, but this was from J and J. So again, uh, we're not using a ton of J and J anyway, and it might be. Uh, useful in that counseling of the patient who had a rash to say, well, we don't, we haven't seen it with the mRNA vaccines, then it might be described with the J&J. &J. Okay, I will end today by discussing the impact of these immediate and delayed allergic presentations um, on public health. We have given over 10 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines throughout the world. Uh, in the U.S., we're at 558 million mRNA vaccines. And this is a little bit more Pfizer than Moderna, 330 million of Pfizer and 210 million from Moderna. Now, there's been no CDC confirmed anaphylaxis deaths or SCAR deaths, but there's been one anaphylaxis death that I can find in the lay press um, from this Kansas woman who apparently the autopsy confirmed it was an allergic reaction that caused her death and it was an mRNA vaccine. But of course, this cannot compare to the morbidity and mortality of COVID-19 itself. Um, and we remember that prior vaccines also could cause anaphylactic deaths. And this, these vaccines have been under a microscope that no prior vaccine has been under for over a year. So I want to review what happened in our, our healthcare employee cohort when you had any allergic symptoms, because it results in incomplete vaccination even in the individuals who are highly motivated to be vaccinated um, and when facing wild type variant, which all of these in this cohort were. Um, so there was very few individuals who didn't get vaccinated, but if you reported on your symptom survey, any allergic symptom, you were five times more likely to not get dose two. And if you reported any severe allergic symptom, you were 23 times more likely to not get dose two. So this was Mass General Brigham employees where we did all of these consultations, we were helpful. We, um, we, this was really our best case scenario we thought. And in that Kaiser cohort that was recently published, they, they realized that 21% of those with treated allergic reactions did not get dose two. So there are so many individuals out there, some with allergies, some without, who are hesitant to receive any COVID vaccination. And it's very challenging to um, provide reassurance and counsel. We can do our best here. But there's also a group that I don't want to forget. These are individuals who went out and got their first vaccine and had a side effect that might be on the skin, might have felt like a, an immediate allergic reaction, it might have been anaphylaxis, might have been a large delayed reaction, 
And these are individuals who are contributing to a diminishing pool of people who are amenable to booster vaccination. And so I see my role and our role in, in, uh, is, is to help sort of replenish this pool and make um, these, these individuals feel good about trying again, because some of these things are not recurring as we discussed. With that, I would like to mention that our registry is open for all cases entered by clinicians, entered by patients. And I would love to thank everyone who's helped me um, with the data that I presented today, uh, my research group, my K mentors were uh, Rochelle Walensky and Alina Banerjee. Um, the MGB was incredibly supportive with providing a, in, an operational infrastructure for an on the go uh, prospective cohort of employees. Um, and then I have a number of key collaborators and funders. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much for your talk. We really appreciate it, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, we can start, if you don't mind, with folks that are uh, present, if anyone has any questions for our speaker, otherwise I can go ahead and progress to uh, some that we have in the chat. Those are excellent questions. The question was about um, is skin reactions, um, local and generalized, and if there um, could be a seasonal variation or geographic variation. Uh, and I think that, that is a, those, those are both excellent research questions. And I think that one of the ch biggest challenges is been tracking these. Um, so I haven't looked at that specifically, but I agree that um, uh, certainly what we see in the Northeast might be higher than in other parts of the country because of the baseline allergy reported by our population um, and cutaneous allergy. I, I haven't seen anything to that. And I think it's a great question maybe to answer with diagnostic codes for urticaria, but I, I doubt that the delayed injection site reaction data would ever get, um, it's very hard to track those, but with urticaria or at least chronic urticaria, that would be a great research question, no data. Oh yes, um, this is this is. So the question was about whether we've been seeing increased um, autoimmunity post vaccination, and what about the reactions that might not be anaphylaxis or urticaria, um, and how to counsel. So we have been trying to identify a couple key clinical leaders in multidisciplinary areas, including neurology has been kind of important to us, um, dermatology. Uh, allergy immunology, and then also endocrine. Um, we've seen a number of patients who, uh, in rheumatology, who, who've uh, had autoantibody formation post-vaccination, and we don't know, uh, I think the causality is quite, quite challenging. It, was it causal from the mRNA vaccines, or did the mRNA vaccines sort of unmask something that was like latent um, and brought to clinical attention? I think that, that that being my clinical hypothesis is what I usually use when I'm counseling patients is that I think that uh, it wasn't caused by the vaccine, but maybe this brought us to our attention and maybe that's a good thing. Um, we have a, a, a couple of people who um, uh, had, had responses like uh, uh, thyroid uh, autoantibodies or high ANA, but then uh, did decrease and then went back and got vaccines and did fine. Um, I also explained sometimes the drug reaction, some of the severe cutaneous cutaneous drug reactions, particularly DRESS syndrome, sometimes is associated with a period, uh, a, an acute period of autoimmunity that then does go away. So I use, I, I draw from, I guess, theoretical immunology knowledge and, and drug allergy knowledge to help patients feel um, at least like we are on top of it and that it wasn't caused by the vaccine.
I'll uh, pose a question from the chat here. Uh, one of our residents, Dr. Wong, asked, are you seeing a similar reaction profile and incidence in the pediatric population? Really good question. So um, I don't need to repeat that, right? Because it was in the microphone. <laughs> uh, so in the pediatric population, there is far less immediate allergic-like responses. And I don't have a great explanation for that but we don't have a ton of nocebo or stress-related response data in pediatrics to my knowledge either. So it could be that um, the adults are more in tune sitting there, 15 minute, 30 minute observation, thinking about the tingling or the, uh, that they might be experiencing or their heart racing, um, and that this hasn't been a problem in pediatrics. We've seen a few cases of anaphylaxis in the Boston area. Um, and then we've also seen some serum sickness-like reactions. So things that look like they're gonna be these delayed onset or to carry out eruptions or morbilliform eruptions, but with profound joint swelling and um, uh, seeming more, um, more serious, more like a serum sickness-like reaction in the pediatric population. Another question for you. Will you please comment on the shingles flare-ups as an immunologic response to COVID-19 mRNA vaccines? Yes. So there have been a number of cases that uh, we've even seen clinically. And when you see it, you can't really uh, dismiss it because it seems like there must be something immunologically happening to have a dormant virus come back out and cause terrible shingles. But it hasn't been studied. Um, uh, it hasn't been proven from a very rigorous epidemiologic perspective, just more case series and our clinical observations, which I'd never want to dismiss because it seems causal, it seems related to me. Um, but when you look at the CDC vaccine safety data link data, and they have a comparison group where you look at an at-risk period of 20 days, and then uh, the first 20 days after vaccination, and then look at the second 20 days, it doesn't seem to have an increased uh, relative risk. Um, of having at least brought to the medical attention of BZV or um, HSV reactivation. So I think that's still something I'd say we, I've observed, but hasn't been proven to be related to an increased risk. Wonderful, thank you for that. Um, I think in the interest of time, this may be the last question for you. There's a couple kind of parts to it. For the chronic spontaneous heart carry after vaccination, it seems like it's most often seen within a couple of weeks of vaccination. Would you expect to see it or any of the other delayed reactions spontaneously occur months after? Is there an upper limit of time latency where you can be confident that events are unrelated to vaccine reaction? Yes, I. so there's no gold standard. Uh, however, I use the 21 days used by the CDC um, as relatedness. So if there's something uh, for, for skin reactions or um, certainly I think for um, once we get farther out, um, uh, autoimmune kind of things or, or uh, blood related things could occur more later and it becomes very challenging. But if we use 21 days um, consistently, um, that that is helpful. Um, and with the urticaria patients, I think that we're seeing a blip immediately. That's very much, you had a vaccine, and then you have some hives. And then there is a group that's happening more like two weeks, that's sort of 10 to, to 16 days afterwards. And it does seem to be related. And if you can think about maybe um, it's the body's immune response to the vaccination, not an allergy to the vaccination. It's reactogenicity. It's this is our, the vaccine's doing its job and it's manifesting in this individual as hives. Perfect. Well, with that, let me extend my thanks once again on behalf of the department. Thank you so much, Dr. Blumenthal, for joining us. Thank you so much to Dr. Kendall and the Division of Allergy and Immunology. And thank you to the Hampton Lectureship. Really appreciate your time. Thank you.